Hi and welcome. Uh, welcome to 10.30. 10.30 is a learning podcast concept where we try to capture the essence of um, several ideas and uh, retain them in just 30 minutes. Uh, we brainstorm ways to implement it and uh, pitch them in just 30 seconds at the end with our BAT specialist. So today's um, episode is about retail shape shifters. Customers are starting to demand more from the brands. The key lies in the retail store where brands can create uh, deeper experiences, diversify, capture new revenue streams. What are they and how could a BAT retail store turn shopping into meaningful, memorable visits? We're going to explore this concept with our expert today, um, Dan Morculescu, who's the CEO and founder of Footprints for Retail. And I'm going to ask you to uh, tell us more a little bit about yourself in a second, Dan. Um, and then we also have here Catalina Chore, um, our media and marketplaces manager at BAT, our colleague, our BAT specialist, um, who will help us um, identify maybe business opportunities or um, areas of applicability. That'd be great. BAT. I'll try. <laughs> so, um, and, I, and I'm Silvio, by the way, I'm Silvio Tsono. I'm a brand executive in uh, new categories in, uh, in the CES area. Um, just to give you a little bit more information on how, how this is going to go, uh, Dan, I'm going to ask you in 10 minutes to provide us a, sort of an explanation. A brief, yeah. A brief, yeah. I have three white cards. I might interrupt Excellent. you. Sorry, uh, apologies in advance for that. Um, then we're going to discuss about the concepts a little bit, brainstorm maybe some ideas on how uh, we could apply this to, to, into our field or industry. And then eventually we're going to have uh, some conclusions and uh, the pitch. The and hopefully the pitch. idea that we're going to implement. The idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all good? Cool. Ready to yeah, go? Perfect. Done, please. I'm Dan Marcolescu and uh, as you said, I'm the founder and CEO of Footprints for Retail. Uh, basically, Footprints for Retail is, um, um, you know, is the company with a great mission to provide the solution of uh, merging, so fusing the offline retail world with the online one. And um, as you can imagine, it's, a, it's an AI uh, driven company and an AI driven mission. Uh, we have plenty of uh, topics on a daily basis when it comes to the consumer and uh, how co could we actually address better and translate the online experience of hyper personalization and on time content delivery and um, you know micro segmentation to the offline experience because as you said the whole um, uh, you know, the, 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 the happy kind of path of the user in the online is not yet um, translated for the offline experience for the, uh, for the indoors. Thank you. Um, tell us more about today's theme. Let's explore the subject. So one of the core um, themes that we have, and um, this is something that is still a, a big question mark, uh, in the world of uh, footprints and uh, the likes um, around the globe is how we can actually predict the physical behaviors of consumers in an ethical and uh, quite accurate way. Uh, so basically, um, the, 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 technolo the technical term is the uh, predictive behavioral modeling, mm -hmm. which means that, um, you know, it's a way of um, defining the means and the tools to capture, to analyze, to structure, and to understand and to predict uh, the, the behaviors, the physical behaviors, so the shopping, the purchases of people and the visits in the uh, indoor retail based on past or present data. So basically, uh, it's a technology that is looking at um, capturing your data over a period of time and then capturing the data from the lookalikes, so the people that are behaving uh, similar to your behavior, your shopping behavior, and then predicting what's your next, uh, what's your next move, what's your next purchase, what's your next visit in the next seven to 30 days. Can I pull a white card here? Great. <laughs> uh, very, yes, we started early with this one. Um, how, uh, as you mentioned, how accurate, how, I mean, how much can we, <laughs> um, how accurate is this data uh, based, on empirical, uh, based on empirical data? Uh, how much can we um, base our decision on, on you know, the data that we mine? Yeah, th there is a lot of philosophy behind 
Uh, the bottom line for, for me, right, is the fact that once you do it, even if it's 5% accurate, it matters that nobody else has it. So it's already a competitive advantage, Fair enough, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's blue sky innovation. On the other side, indeed, there are some you know, quite technical uh, ways of measuring the accuracy. And in, um, in, in artificial intelligence, it's not about like in human behavior, like in you know, learning s some new skills. It's not about the initial accuracy, it's about the feedback loop and the learning curve. Mm -hmm. So let's say, let's imagine you have a 5% accuracy, so 5 out of 100 people you actually successfully predict the fact that they will be going to a shopping center, you know, today at whatever, 3 p.m. But 95 you missed, yeah, you fail predicting that. Yeah. And it's not about today, it's about the fact that if you do that one, you know, over, over the next year, right, or, or over the next five years, the gap of knowledge and uh, predictive kind of um, capability of your business is going to be uh, creating a gap larger and ra larger, right? So it's the ge geometrical progression, right, mm -hmm. of competitive advantage through innovation. Compounding. Compounding. Yeah. So that's, that's all about. Um, again, it doesn't matter. It's, it's all about starting to do it and putting it into a business process. I'm going to write some key takeaways here because I have to, have to explain them at the end. Um, yeah, please. If I will move on with the, uh, so yeah, I will uh, distill the, the, the explanation. So basically, in order to understand the need and the whole um, idea behind, we need to go back to the online retail, right? And uh, the whole digital convenience that uh, this technology and the, the business models behind brought to the consumer life. So at the moment, we are, um, in terms of shopping, in terms of selling, in terms of searching, it's the you know, easiest way ever to do it, right? Before that, we had a shopping mall, right? One place to go, and then yeah. the whole basket of you know, needs and purchases it was there. But nowadays, we can just spend a few seconds instead of a few hours, and we can do the same. Yeah. So the translation of and the change that it brought by the digital convenience, now it affects Most definitely, yeah. our per perceived right, value that the physical retailers are bringing us. And they did nothing, right? So they're still there. They're as good as before. But just the fact that the digital convenience was brought in our life, this actually made us look at the physical retailers, right? in a certain different way. And I'm assuming this has been accelerated in the past couple of years. Indeed. Everything is you know, faster, better, and cheaper, and you know, more near real-time delivery, whatever. Yeah. So basically, when we talk, we talk about the consumer expectations, we talk about digital convenience expectations. This made um, the work of retail brands a lot um, you know, oh, harder. Yeah. Tougher, and yeah you know, more money to be poured in and more questions to be had rather than, you know, delivered. Which is a great thing, of course, for us as well, for Footprints, because there is a, now there is the, that, that time in the evolution of the retail market where, you know, a lot of experiments are being run. A lot of money is poured in to find the answer, right? So we are still in the discovery, uh, discovery yeah. phase. Yeah. phase. So this is why Footprints is basically the mission is to translate the digital convenience into the physical retail by using the same principles, not the same technologies, because the technologies, they're not there yet, right? It's quite easy to track and build a profile of a user based on the landing page, the campaign they, they clicked on, the very color of the product that they actually um, took into consideration, clicked, and they wanted to purchase. More than that, you know exactly how much time they are exactly. spending on a web on page. On the page, and in your store you don't. Exactly, and then you, you know, where and how that path is being fulfilled, right, with a purchase. And more than that, if it's not a purchase, you can retarget those. <laughs> And even more and better for business is that you can actually build an audience 
with a look-alike, with a similar behavior, and then find 1,000 other people that will do the so same how behavior. how do you do it in offline? Mm. So all your time spent in a shop, all the you know, browsing and searching that you do in a store or shopping mall, that, you know, that can generate value. The technologies are quite hard, right? First of all, you need to uh, capture the data, which is basically using the infrastructure in place like you know, public Wi-Fi, video cameras, all the other signals in terms of GPS, you know, mobile devices, you know, wearables, anything that can make sense to acquire quality data. But quality data doesn't mean that, uh, you know, I, I need to see Catalina actually within the shopping mall. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to see Catalina from the entrance to the exit, and I need to see exactly what's the temperature outside, you know, if it was a driving time that brought her uh, into the shopping mall, and then what's the exact order of the shops she's actually browsing and shopping uh, through. Exactly like in online. So a very proper consumer journey. A very, very proper complex. consumer journey, yeah. exactly like that. So uh, we do that. We do that in an anonymous way, of course, uh, because even if it is going to be possible, you don't care in data systems and predictions for each individual consumer. Obviously. Right? You need behavioral segments, so micro segments or larger segments where you know exactly they are going to be in a shopping mall on a certain day or at a certain hour because of weather, promotions, etc., etc. That's so, very cool because we have segments in media and obviously we have spec segments in what you know we're doing and sometimes they don't you know match like what we think we, who we think we sell, sell to is not the same to who we advertise to it is maybe not the same who's actually buying our products so i think it'd be really cool if we could you know maybe map these segments and see you know where the matches and mismatches are and that's i can you know from my from my perspective right i can uh, understand why because Social demographics actually fail, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that I'm a male with a certain age, uh, it doesn't mean that that's going to tell you mm -hmm. about my yeah. purchase intent. Yeah, that's true. The fact that I'm going to, I have a very funny example, the fact that I'm going to get a link from Silvio on WhatsApp and I'm going to actually tap on it and go on a certain website, let's say Red Bicycles, it doesn't mean that I'm, I have an inter purchase intent, but Google will translate it to you and you'll buy for that information from Google, right? Because that's a visit. I'm going to do a research and Google will tell you that I'm in market for red bicycles. Although I was just browsing to help Silvio to make a decision. That's, yeah, that's a good point. On the other side, let's imagine I'm going to move my ass from this chair walk downstairs, take my car, drive it, park it in the shopping mall, and then spend time in a certain shop for red bicycles. And that's the principle behind why the data, the behavioral data in the physical retailers is the most valuable data that you can actually mine and put into your business processes. Because the physical location is what really matters, right? Does it matter as much as it did before, the physical location? It matters because, great, uh, very great uh, question. Uh, as I'm you from can digital, see, sorry. you are from digital, <laughs> indeed. You are a non-believer. <laughs> no, going to just, no way, no way. You are prepared to, to have the no, switch. No, 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 I'm not the switch, but Baptize I think it's, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Now, have you ever wondered why Amazon is basically buying the same and opening the same spaces, retail spaces, that other retailers in the United States are actually closing down. Same spaces, same you know, spaces. No huge uh, change in terms of footfall, right? Yeah. Uh, the community is still there. The same people are living there. But Amazon is actually- It's going in offline, yeah. It's going Retail offline. Gravitational pull, as you mentioned earlier. <laughs> exactly like that. So uh, luckily for footprints, we are still um, in the physical uh, world. Um, the whole behaviors are being influenced by 
let's say the social proximity, the fact that you know we are living in the same neighbor, mm -hmm. and I see you are wearing a certain brand, mm -hmm. and I'm, that's going to influence me. I'm going to have a more trust into the, that brand. The fact that if I'm going to order a product, I can actually conveniently go back to the store when I want and uh, return it instead of waiting for two, three days until the courier services will actually pick it up mm -hmm. to, to take it back. And uh, also because the, the physical reality still works as a um, trust factor, right? If we see that it exists, it means that there is a lot of trust to be put into that, right? Versus online. Online is fuzzy. Brands appear and disappear every day. Things are changing. We don't like changes. Yeah. Um, trust is probably at a lower level. Trust is indeed. And basically when we order, so that's a symptom, right? When you order large, it means that you don't trust. So you take advantage of that to return a lot of other products until you select one, right? So a lot of other you know, negative aspects mm -hmm. for the all online. More than that, we already have the spammy, very you know, volume-based advertising, right? And we don't like that as well, right? Because we are on our path to search and purchase something. Yeah. Um, so so the, the, this is called, a, so, sorry for that, this is called a halo effect, right? What I'm trying to explain. So the fact that there is a, there is a point of presence, there is a retail store somewhere or a shopping mall. This shopping mall, as you, you mentioned, uh, has a retail gravitational pull, like uh, the solar system is actually influencing, uh, you know, the path of different planets, even, you know, Pluto, whatever, if it's a planet or not, but it still, you know, influences that pathway. Mm -hmm. So in this same way, there is a retail gravitational pull. So there is a influence to, uh, that is being um, generated by a retail property to the people that are living nearby, right? And what's the, now the beauty of it is that the same retail gravitational pull, which let's say it's two dimensional, it's on a flat earth, not flat earth, but you know, the round, but on a flat surface. Now it's actually a sphere in a sense that it has the same influence for our online searches, for our online shops, shopping, for our online purchases and returns. So the way that the physical presence of a brand or a retail property is influencing our online behavior is direct. And uh, the lockdown uh, two years ago and last year actually demonstrated that, the exact, this principle to all the retail brands in the United States, especially the big retailers. So what they've seen, they've seen that although their retail properties were closed, closed, right? Nobody was actually going inside. They had eight times more sales clustered around the retail properties. Wow. Wow, that's huge. Even though online so, sales were much, much accelerated. More than that. So we're talking about volumes. Yeah. Now the share of wallet during last year for an online pure play was $27. The share of wallet for um, physical retail only player was $97. Yeah, and I remember that example from- $243 is the share of the omni-channel with offline and online well, in a certain- Marge. Yeah. Okay, cool. So huge. Yeah, I, I remember that uh, article uh, during the pandemic when uh, the re revenge shopping happened in one uh, retail <laughs> luxury store and people spent, I don't know, $3 million uh, in, in that one oh, retail wow. store yeah. in, in China. Uh, in Shanghai maybe, or Hong Kong in one weekend. So I really like where this is going and uh, I would like to, to get a little bit more into how would this translate for um, like maybe business opportunities for our uh, industry, or for, for our brands? So you just mentioned that um, there is a gap between what the online is promising to you, right? In terms of audiences and how you actually invest in marketing and how the addressability, right, works, right? Mm -hmm. And the reality of the campaign Customer. performance at the end, right? And the customer journey and yeah. what's on the funnel and what's out of the funnel, right? So the whole perspective here is that, as I can see it for uh, retail brands like, like yourselves, 
you can actually start looking at uh, strategic partnerships with retail properties and retail operators, right? Like FMCG players and, you know, uh, shopping malls and shopping mm -hmm. centers. And instead of looking at the presence uh, investment, you know, as an investment as in, into the presence, you need to start looking at the audience data that is actually the real deal and the real asset of these retail properties. So it's not about me going um, and working, bis you know, uh, near your, um, you know, pop-up store or something like that. It's about the fact that I have a p path to purchase. Mm -hmm. I have some intent there, and if you can capture that, although I'm not going to be nearby your pop-up store, that's most valuable to you as a business rather than the fact that I'm going inside the store. What I'm telling here is about the fact, and this is the new paradigm, right, that it's actually boosting this thing that I'm discussing about, which is called retail media in the United States. So now the physical retail is perceived as the most efficient, most cost efficient channel, media channel. So basically, well. if you put Facebook and Google and whatever other advertising platforms, and then you put the re retail store and you compare them with the same benchmarks, the customer acquisition cost is the lowest. Despite um, right. Huge costs like in rent and rent is well, the, going the down. The cool thing is that BAT is doing a lot of retail advertising. So, and besides that, we also have going further into the brainstorming storming mood. We also have like a, a, an island in in Bonassa Shopping City, and uh, we also have a van that can move around. So, my question is. Could we do something with those? And for example, okay, we have a van that that's uh, right now it's outside Afi or another mall, and it's going to go to the seaside, and it's going to go to Electric Castle, and so on. So could we have I don't know get some data on consumers that actually go to the van and the you know to yeah. the proximity and you know understand better? And yeah, of could course. we do, yeah? Mm -hmm. How would that work? So um, of course there is a infrastructure to be put in place. Mm -hmm. So there is an uh, hardware upgrade that you need to do. And also the Wi-Fi, right? I mean, uh, including the Wi-Fi. Okay. And uh, basically you are looking at that as a point of presence. Mm -hmm. And then you need to basically define the area around the, the van, right? That makes sense for you. For mm -hmm. example, for a shopping mall, maybe it makes sense for the whole city to be mapped. Uh, but for a van, it's about, you know, closer. Yeah. Kind of yeah, distance. and also it depends on where it goes because I suppose you know, when you're at exactly. the festival, it's like Bonsida. When you're at you know the seaside, it's yeah, like yeah, the streets yeah. that are around you and, st and stuff. And that needs to be a factor for uh, to optimize and to s do the settings within the hardware, the Wi-Fi, for mm -hmm. example. You know, it's larger broadcast or and uh, basically then you need to start. So what kind at the of audiences. data? Yeah, what kind of data could you get about the audience in what time and what's some, what are some action points that you can do after you have this data? I mean, what can you do with this? Besides, you know, get some insights on them, like they actually don't like the col color purple on your device or whatever. But what is something that you can, you know, have something, some real action to be done So there, there are two, two ways. So basically you can go to, let's say, Bonassa. Yeah. And because Bonassa has obviously multiple stores, you can imagine it's it's a basically a marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. So you know the high potential value customers that walk into uh, the Bonassa shopping mall and go to the high value brands, right? The expensive brands. You can look at the high frequency kind of visitors, uh, the ones that are having a visit duration, dwell time, you know, longer in, let's say, the playground, the cinema, whatever. So you, you can have that data and not the, the data directly, but the advertising basically service to target those profiles based on that behavior. I need to find an example like, you know, high potential value customers, right? The value customers that basically they go and spend time and money into 
um, high-priced uh, brands, uh, you know, certain shops. Or the customers that might be into devices, because for example, for us, it doesn't matter so much to have technology, like, people with high yeah. income, but they're super into technology and this Tech is something, savvy. yeah, okay. Yeah. I have a question here, since we're exploring ideas. So, okay, we're getting this data about this customer, we know when they're going to the mall, is, do you see the possibility of maybe, you know, predicting that they're going to go to the mall on a Saturday yeah. afternoon at 4 p.m., prompting an ad on their uh, phone with our brand or...? So the technology that we have at the moment allows you to indeed predict the next visit. More than that, predict the um, exact order of the shops that are going to the path, yeah, the, the whole path from entry to exit. And understand if that's, let's say, um, influenced by the weather outside, promotions, proximity, whatever. Mm -hmm. So this could help you to actually, let's say, um, personalize or you know the offering or the message mm -hmm. based on the predictive traffic, right? The kind yeah. of people that you are expecting on that day, instead of having a standard, you know, predefined um, message with, you know, basically even clothing can be changed, right? Because you know that you know maybe they are going to be uh, it's going to be more appealing to certain audiences versus other people right yeah on the other side indeed we are most probably the only com company in the world that is capable to fuse the data the behavioral data right because just the fact that I, we can actually look at uh, mobile devices and wearables and what they do inside the shopping mall and build profiles and predict on their behavior it doesn't mean that we can actually push a message to your exactly. mobile yeah. mm -hmm. But what we have, we basically have this audience, which is behavioral audience, we can push a message, but then we have the online audience, the web audience from social media, from websites, from mobile apps that is gravitating around the same, mm -hmm. the Bonessa shopping mall, say. And we do the fu fusion of this data. Okay. In this way, you can actually run campaigns today that are going to go to people that are most likely to go to the shopping mall tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> and their top interest in terms of uh, purchase in intent is okay. into technology brands. Mm -hmm. And how expensive is to get this, um, this kind of data? It became a lot, a lot less expensive. So when we started, that was in 2014, we had a 40% penetration rate, mm -hmm. uh, less than that, so four out of 10 people. And the data quality was poor. But then um, the fact that uh, Google Maps is now pushing you to open the Wi-Fi for better location data and- mm -hmm. It helps. Uh, it helps, right? And now we are at 87%. Yeah which is great. Of course, there's a cost to data. So more data, less cost per user, per cohort, per segmentation, yeah. per segment. And uh, on the second thing, indeed, the whole, you can imagine, you can do that in, you know, with a, with a physical computer right here, right? So you need cloud computing, yeah. which is, was very expensive when we started. Now it's not expensive. Exactly. Yeah. And AI running in cloud is great and is not as expensive as before. I'm trying to figure out if the acquisition cost for a customer based on this sort of advertising would make sense for the company to pay the certain yeah. amount to... Uh, Maybe to, to pilot it in one place, in one island, and then, you know, just to make it happen for, for the whole country. But, like, my question is, what would the time frame be for such a project? I mean, from T0... How long does it take until you have some data and you can actually do something? Again, if you want to target those audiences, that's today. You can do that today because we already have retail properties that we mm -hmm. operate and we manage and you can mm -hmm. buy advertising services. Mm -hmm. On the other side, if you want your own data, your own physical behavior, that's a two to three months uh, kind of project. It's not. And you can, you can uh, speaking of the fuse, for example, because we're in this category where performance media is kind, it's kind of off limits, um, would you guys be able to have this fuse made with, um, I don't know, publishers, websites, or stuff like that? Because, you know, I'm just asking yeah. where it's possible to go. The fusion of data, it's a matter of having basically 
two databases, two mm -hmm. data sets, and doing the magic to fuse it. So as you know, as long as we have a publisher with their own audience data that you are actually collaborating with. But you don't use cookies and stuff like that because it's going to be a cookie-less world pretty it's soon. It's going to be, and that's a great thing for us. Okay, <laughs> cool. Another great thing. Uh, okay, I mean, I think we could go f uh, with this forever because it's very interesting yeah. and I, at least I learned a lot of new things. But uh, I will have to sum it up now and a few key takeaways and then maybe we can think of a, <laughs> a pitch, a, okay. an idea to pitch. So I wrote here, um, um, you just have to start collecting the data. That's, I think, one key takeaway. And also having kind of a medium to long term perspective on it mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. order to get accurate uh, accuracy, high, high level of accuracy. Then um, I have here the digital convenience that's uh, influencing a lot the retail experience. So that's extremely important. Uh, and I, here I had a side question, if you could uh, be very brief in answering this. Um, does it matter for which type of industry the retail store um, is still important uh, in, for example, luxury stores, or is it all over the place? Is something like an average for also FMCG and um, it's, it's for all the retail verticals. Oh, okay. um, of course, it's like in online. Um, you know, the short answer is you'll get a lot more um, understanding of who Silvio is and what Silvio, um, you know, wants if you have a website with more mixed content, mm -hmm. right? If you have a website only with, let's say, you know, promoting water and page one is about water, page two is about water, you know, and so on, you'll only know that, you know, so there's a user. Water. Yeah. <laughs> but when you go to a marketplace like e e Ima Imag, right? Mm -hmm. You know plenty about, you can know plenty about Silvio, right? Yeah. This is uh, the principle behind what we do for the physical retail. Mm -hmm. The more complex, the more brands, the more complex the, the, the shopping experience, the better data we have. Yeah, and the third uh, key takeaway I wrote down here is that retail is still king, despite uh, the perception that you know we've seen such a huge acceleration of online shopping, uh, as you said, 85%? 85% on average, on uh, average glo global average. Still happens in retail, so uh, I think it will have some very nice parallels with the other episodes. Yeah, yeah for sure, for uh, sure. Because we did talk about delivery apps also, we are going to talk about delivery apps. Um, so, it, pitching the idea, Let's see. I think that, <laughs> but they do go hand in hand, digital with, with offline. Um, so basically, I think it would be two stages. First stage would be to kind of implement uh, this technology in our Glow Island in Bonassa. First of all, to get info on the target groups that come there. And I think this would actually help with product innovation and also with accessories because you know you get the data to what people buy your products and you also understand what they like and what they might be attracted to secondly second stage i would go move this further to the glovan because it's going around more places and around events so you can get info about the people there and you can actually find engagement opp opportunities that are actually relevant to them so they can they can you know uh, engage with us. So thank you so much and for sure we'll, we'll uh, keep in touch. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was a great one, Catalina. Dan, thank you very much. Thank you, Catalina. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, and for you, thank you for watching and uh, stay curious and keep learning. <laughs> thank you.